Um, and we're going to start with uh, Patricia, uh, which, uh, apart from being a professor at Arizona University, she's a, a director and co-founder of Youth Mappers. Um, and she's going to talk about the experience in Youth Mappers. Uh, I'm going to be taking questions first from uh, Venueless, so you are welcome to post your questions there. And maybe I will take also from the audience. Go ahead, Patricia. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, I seem to have that effect sometimes on technology. I apologize. It has been one of the greatest privileges of my career to serve as the director and co-founder of Youth Mappers. And uh, my home institution is Arizona State University. Premise of what I would like to share with you today really has to do with the fact that we need more study on the cultural and organizational aspects of the mappers within the state of the map. Uh, and I like to think of OpenStreetMap not just as the map, not just as this data platform, but really as a community, and I like to call them the community of communities. It's not just a corporate versus individual, simplistic dualism. It is really we have multiple identities when we embrace the map. And uh, I think Youth Mappers lends itself very well as an interesting design framework uh, for how to interrogate what this looks like in a cultural and organizational aspect. So I'd like to talk really quickly about who are youth mappers, what do they do, how do they map, a little bit about the design, and then get right into some hypotheses I have that we can test to see whether what this actually looks like. And finally, we'll just talk about what that implies for OSM broadly and our sector more specifically. First, who in this room are youth mappers members? Would you please raise your hand really quickly? Who are also organizers and or supporters slash sponsors? Great, so I'm gonna go very quickly over the next few slides because you all know, and those of you who didn't raise your hands, please see one of these people, they're wonderful. I'm privileged to speak on behalf of the community. We ideated this concept in 2014 and um, launched it in 2015 with the support and sponsorship of USAID. And as I mentioned, um, you know, we really are a community within that broader community. Everyone who was a student at some point, um, and that's who we focus on, university students. That's our chief target audience. Uh, so we are a global consortium of student-led, but also faculty-mentored and campus-based chapters. Um, students will create and use OpenMap for whatever research, humanitarian, and development purposes. As of this week, uh, we have 324 university campuses that have been launched in 57 countries. You see our map there. I think 5,000 is a kind of a conservative estimate. Uh, many places of the world that had been previously uh, underrepresented on OpenStreetMap, 79% of them in so-called majoritarian nations, and 45% of our youth mappers, we estimate, are women across the board. This, I believe, does help contribute to that diversity that we're seeking within the OpenStreetMap community and lays a great foundation for the future. We have a, a, a mechanism whereby which students themselves also provide peer support to each other through our regional ambassadors, and we have a managing director. Thank you, Marcella. Uh, we are not just university-based. Our main um, founding institutions are Texas Tech, George Washington University, West Virginia University, and Arizona State serves as the fiscal lead. USAID is our co-founding other organization, but a host of communities interact with youth mappers and support us in many, many ways. Um, and thanks, Carrie, Michael, and Rory. So when you look to see where the output has been of youth mappers over across time, you could see we ramped up and I think it's exponential contributions. And, but in areas of the world that had previously been uh, less represented on OpenStreetMap features, um, these are uh, by youth mappers whose usernames we know. So it's a conservative estimate, about 16 million buildings over time, um, over 500,000 roads, 87,000 amenities, uh, and many, many different countries. They are based in many countries and mapping in those many countries. Total changes over time, exponential growth. If you want to know more about some of these uh, metrics, we do have an activity mapper. And thanks, Jenny. Not only do we map, uh, we support students to join together to, to do that social active mapping, but uh, we do provide support in the sense of validating that. We want to make sure that they're quality mapped if they have the youth mappers uh, name attached to it, and thanks, Richard. We also do training, uh, an academy that is very robust and linked to industry standards and national education standards. Thanks, Nua. 
in addition to the wiki and the OSM communication channels that we record uh, that we recommend our students uh, through those trainings, not just technical, but how to engage with the community. We also have our own communications mechanisms and uh, blog, social media, follow us. Thanks, Sarah. Um, of course, we liked for our students to receive internships. We started a virtual internship at USA Geo Center pre-pandemic, thanks to Chad. We continue some of those with our Everywhere She Maps program, which is also focusing on women, not as an afterthought, but a very critical part of our community. And um, thanks, Courtney. Students, of course, like to use the data that they create, and they're motivated by that data creation. Uh, so we offer some field work grants and research fellowship opportunities so that they're also supported in the use of that data. Thanks, Brent. And finally, we really don't believe that young people are the leaders of the future. They're actually leaders today. And so we need to support them in those kinds of aspects of being a good member of our community. And in all, as of this coming January, we will have had 118 fellows go through our program. They are not just human sensors, collecting data, sticking on the map, youth mappers, if you haven't met them yet, they are very intellectually minded, academically minded, in fact, and uh, our book that's coming out, uh, there's 68 co-authors along with us demonstrating a lot of use cases and a lot of innovation in tools and intellectual innovations as well. Youth mappers map with, together with our communities in their local communities, they map yet yeah, based at the university, but they come from all over the, the country that they live in and they map together with each other, sometimes across borders. That's why you hear us say a lot, we don't just build maps, we build mappers. Okay, that's a quick rundown. Where are we situated in this community of communities? Um, uh, a couple of years ago in the Manual of Digital Earth, um, Maria Provelli and I um, and some co-authors wrote about what that looks like within the concept of digital earth. And I suggested a table in there, which uh, you could use or not use, how we can define these categories. And they are not mutually exclusive. You can identify a community on the basis of what sector they're in. In the case of youth mappers, we are squarely in the academic sector. You can define a community on the basis of how they engage with the map, data contributors to providers of data to validators to consumers and users and youth mappers really does a little bit of all of those things um, depending on you know which chapter you're talking about and finally you can think about them as social based categories right um, purpose driven identity driven you can really see our, our community is student oriented and place based so within the context of academia which we really have to look at uh, it's important to think through the last couple of decades how academia has really been reevaluating itself as a place for learning within these global economic realities. Now, that's globalization, right? So that means are we preparing students for a global workforce or are we preparing them to become global citizens in the liberal arts um, sort of mentality? Of course, some people embrace that opportunity. Some people are skeptical whether this is even possible. And I guess there's also people who would like to reject the whole um, uh, project of, of change based on the underlying ideology behind globalization. I'm taking a much more practical approach, thinking about what are the relevant threads within that transformation that we need to consider as we continue to design and unfold what does it mean to have a youth mappers community and open street map. We really do need to rethink that our pedagogy. Uh, we need to think about the performance. This is a very performative kind of action. It's somewhere in between the formal education and informal education space. Uh, and maybe could we be thinking of ourselves as a multi-scalar hybrid organization that spans the intersectional identities, both at the individual student scale, but also at the collective university community-wide, global scale. I also like to think about uh, the work of Soja, a geographer who defines third space as a way of understanding and acting to change the spatiality of human life. Transcends those dualisms. It's not an either or kind of concept, um, but really um, thinks about how we move through our work 
in a way that resolves those contradictions and also synthesizes contributions from post-colonial scholars. Uh, we do not want to reproduce colonialism, what uh, Brent calls digital colonialism, through our actions on the map. This resonates with our motto that we uh, youth mappers define their world by mapping it. There's a lot more to say about this, and here's an article, if you would like to read it, that I co-authored with six youth mappers, literally from every region of our community. So, now let's get to the hypothesis testing. If this is the design, how do we think about it? If we do not see evidence of participating youth that either map only locally or remotely, but not both, then that busts, myth, uh, um, busts the myth that youth mappers cannot be hybrid, right? We do not think of ourselves as both local or remote. Something else to consider. Can participating youth simultaneously pursue their personal aims to prepare themselves for the workforce and to express their identities as global citizens, as in this higher education context? Can participating youth articulate those actions as something that is contributing to society? Does it really rise to the level of a movement? So these are the things I want to consider with some data. As for the first one, uh, local versus global. I know this is much more subtle in real life. I really like the, this work by Wosu Hefer and Ladenbach um, about the many different scales of local versus global. But for our purposes, we're just going to take those to the explicit, which is remote, and the local or implicit mapping. And since we do not have the actual hometowns of our students, we take the country of uh, origin of the chapter. Uh, as the local location, and any other country would be global. So out of the 1,856 usernames that we do have, which is maybe about 37% of our community, uh, you can see that uh, the percentage of exclusively local mappers is 29% of the mappers. Uh, the exclusively remote mappers are 23%, and youth mappers who do both are 48% of our community. However, when you look at their output, the vast majority of the output on the map is done by youth mappers who do both. In fact, 96% of the edits by that group of mappers. So when we look also at what they are mapping, at what kinds of uh, features and attributes are they mapping, um, in all, 60% of buildings are mapped in country, 57% of roads, and 95% of amenities, which is really encouraging. Uh, in, among those, we have the gender information for 500, so a, a little less than half of them, 41%, excuse me. Um, they do map differently. Our, our female mappers tend to be slightly more likely to map remotely in general and least likely to map highways locally, um, but they map amenities at about the same rate. Uh, we also have considered and analyzed our blogs, a couple of years worth of blogs, and all 82 different blogs are all written exclusively by youth mappers and um, tra tracked the utterances or the mentions of how they um, attribute the effect of their participation, whether it was as an individual or as a group. Um, so regardless of region, positive aspects of learning as a group and as an individual is present, but they more one third more frequently in the over time they represent themselves as learning as a group. That's a very important social indicator of the design. Um, qualitatively, too, we see this ease of navigating the tension between the individual benefits and the and the global local benefits uh, in these kinds of um, work. Uh, we also conducted a survey, 205 respondents. Um, and presented them with reflection statements where we can see that there's no statistically significant difference here um, between the strength of agreement to such statements as uh, it is uh, important to me to be a good citizen, to give back to society, and on the other hand, finding a good job, finding a rewarding job. Um, all of them are very strong. There's no statistical difference be among those. However, by region, we do see that there are some differences whereby finding a good job is of greater importance relative to youth mappers who are in the so-called global north compared to the so-called global south. Um, but the indicators are strong that they are actually performing, right? 
30% of all youth mappers reported receiving a paid internship as a direct result of their participation, and more than 10% of them reported having received a job offer. So, while all respondents everywhere did agree strongly that they uh, know how mapping could impact their local community, this was even stronger, statistically significantly so, among youth mappers who are in majoritarian nations. This uh, reveals this spectrum of balance between their interests as the extent to which they reflect on their personal skills and um, the global citizenship, as well as the individual and the collective, right? So, um, but what, does this rise to the level of being viral, being a movement, right? What, what does this mean? So we're gonna test this idea whether they can articulate those things in, uh, in their work with respect to broader goals, broader targets like the sustainable development goals or a social good. And indeed, we do see that those same sources, the blogs, the surveys um, reveal an awareness and an orientation to those targets. Um, regardless of region, gender, and they attribute this to their youth mappers participation. In fact, this was one of the inspirations for the book that we are publishing that I mentioned earlier that I hope that you can get a copy of because it's open access. It will be. Um, but there were two areas um, that were statistically significantly different. And this is in the ways that the longer time that a respondent had spent participating in youth mappers, the more likely they were to, to say that I understand the important role that youth play in promoting and attaining SDGs. I can confidently explain the contributions of youth mapping activities to the attainment of SDGs. So the longer the time they spent as a youth mapper member, the greater the strength of agreement with that, those statements. So let's look at some conclusions. What can we take away from this for OSM broadly, for the academic sector where we work and for the other communities of interest, uh, you know, whoever you might be representing within that open street map ecosystem. All right, I'm gonna claim that we can reject hypothesis one, that participating youth neither map only locally or remotely. That's objectively the case, but what can we take away from that? This affirms that youth mappers by design, being a team sport, life is a team sport, and so is open street map. They do both, and it's really important to um, recognize that we see ourselves in these multiple ways and that we design our activities to bring out both the individual and the collective benefits of being a member of a community within OpenStreetMap. I think we can reject the second hypothesis that they do not simultaneously seek job and being a good citizen kind of benefits, uh, and they do express their identities as global citizens. So this really means that we, we can take those aims of higher education to not be impossible. Maybe we do need to take a purposeful design, create that space in between uh, that is not the formal education, but putting the students in the leadership role, in a social role, um, and being supported by institutions outside of academia. So that's that third space that I think, we all could think about where is that third space within our organization. And then let's also reject hypothesis number three. I think that the viral, uh, reach of constantly adding uh, chapters, one chapter a week consistently for the last eight years, um, gives me an indication that we can't say that this was not movement-minded. The fact that students can actually take away the idea that they imagine themselves in real ways and performative ways, that they are creating this social infrastructure, um, that OpenStreetMap really does need to take seriously. We are talking about creating a more diverse community, set of communities, I think this is where it's going to come from. Where is that future coming from? And um, I believe that we see a lot of um, important potential here. So I wanna leave you with this last thought about OpenStreetMap reproducing itself of the future with some advice that I received when I asked a student of mine, what can I do? What do I need to do? Um, what do we need to all do better? Be a good ancestor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I ever saw someone so happy when her hypothesis were rejected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so we have some questions uh, online. Um, how do you know if the single students map remotely or physically? Also, 
given that university students change every year when they leave university, how do you keep counting who is and who is not within the network? Very good question. It's really hard to get a hold of because um, we do not require the holding of any information. It's all voluntary. Uh, chapters who do sign up with us and are in good standing, they provide us a list of the OSM usernames. So that means that they are eligible for the kinds of benefits that I mentioned, the fellowships and the scholarships. Um, uh, so we do know what chapter they're at and we do know where they're mapping. Um, and hashtags are not a very good way to do this because people just use hashtags. So these are estimates, obviously. Um, I, I, I do think that they're pretty good indicators. Uh, I, I mentioned an operational definition of local versus global. We cannot say that it's only the city that their university is in because universities collect students from all around the countryside. So that's an operational definition of the difference between local and global. We have no other way of knowing. Um, what was the second part of the question? Uh, also, given that the university students change every year. Oh, yes. When they they change. Here. Yeah, it's very hard to get a hold of this. Uh, you know, they, we encourage a transition. We have all sorts of best practices for that. Um, but we are moving now to OSM teams. We're working with OSM teams and DevSeed and really interested in what that tool is going to look like and super excited that that's going to help us organize um, communities within communities. Great, thanks. Uh, I think kind of related uh, a question about you have information about the retention rate of youth member members after the university academia participation participation and i will add looking at blogs and stuff like that could there be also a bias in you looking at those that manage to have good experience within youth mappers and hence have a specific kind of mappers okay. you're looking at okay the first one was about second one was about the blog uh, yeah, retention rate up retention there. Rate. Yeah, uh, you know, we really cannot track 100% of our youth mappers, and so we don't, we are not able to track hard retention rates. However, um, there's a lot of anecdotal influence of, about uh, youth mappers going in and, and serving in hot memberships, going on and creating UN mappers elsewhere, getting jobs. <laughs> and uh, serving the community. So you see them around. Uh, I don't think 100% retention rate is even our goal. And when I teach my class and I have a student go through my class and they learn something about this, I'm happy. They're gonna go off and be a lawyer, but now they know something about OpenStreetMap. That's not really our goal is the retention rate per se. Um, the fact that we do have high quality students and that they do, a, a good number of them do come back and serve the community. That is a really good indicator for me. In terms of the blogs, what we were we were not looking at how much they said something positive versus negative, but when they mentioned something positive in the blog, were they mentioning it as this was positive for me as an individual or positive because it was a part of the group? So that was the difference. So I think, you know, I'm not trying to claim that there might be not be some negative experiences with youth mappers, and sometimes those negative experiences does happen, which is why I say be a good ancestor. Great, thanks. Um, do you have more details about what POIs are most mapped by gender or sex? Not by gender or sex, but POIs, um, Jennings helped me out in my memory. What is our most, usually they're, they've been schools and hospitals, I believe, right? The points of interest that we've seen, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. And I haven't done the analysis by gender, but that's a good question. I think I'd like to see that. Okay, it was worth asking. So our last question before we move on to the next session. Um, are there challenges faced by volunteer, by youth mappers when participating in OSM? And what are some incentives given to them that have helped motivate or grow their participation? Yes, of course. Um, I think there's a lot of challenges that they face and a lot of the myths, right, that they only armchair map. Obviously, that's not true. Um, that they are low quality. Obviously, that's not true. And we do provide support and incentives for that. Um, the academy, for example, to train them and the validation hub to make sure that their, their quality is good. Um, by participating and continuing that participation, they get to be to apply for the fellowships and the scholarships, which is their identity beyond the map but their academic identity. So I think the blurring and the melding of this is really giving you know, a lot of students 
opportunities to grow and see beyond, uh, you know, simply being a human sensor, that they can use the data that they create and um, become a member of the community and help each other through some of those challenging times. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Patricia.